Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to English Poetry at the Islamic University of uh, Gaza. Today, we try to wrap up our uh, sessions on uh, the metaphysical poets, the John Donne School. Uh, for the sake of the, because this is not a course dedicated to metaphysical poetry, we're only taking samples and we're focusing on John. But there is one amazing follower of John Donne, probably one of the most famous followers of John Donne, uh, whose name is uh, George Herbert. So we'll have uh, a look at one of his poems or two, and then we'll uh, see what features metaphysical poets had or or have, and then discuss them with examples, etc. Uh, this is the poem we're going to study for uh, George Herbert. Not sure if this seems anyway different from the poems we already studied. Probably the shape. This is one from a book. Do you know that time of Shakespeare, they use this if like instead of s? Yeah. Even u instead of v. You know, typing was not still standardized, even spelling. But this is significant. I don't want to say stuff about it, but it changes many things about words and how they were written and how we, re we, we, we read them now. Uh, this is the poem. This is the poem. Okay. So, yeah, probably the shape is uh, different. It's no longer, you know, a box or a rectangular. <coughs> the shape is no longer fixed and sacred. This is something that started with the metaphysicals. So, I want just to give you an example of uh, this poem called Arith. Some of you might be using uh, Snapchat already, you know, the wreath. Snapchat, like the crown, but made of uh, flowers and roses. Yes, yes. What's, what's it called? On, uh, on Snapchat. You're using it on Arabic language? Okay, good, good for you. So Arith is something, you know, Jesus, uh, Christianity Jesus was crucified and he uh, uh, had they put this wreath made of thorns around his head and probably because George Herbert is a pure religious poet he's a devotional poet unlike John Donne who was 50-50 early in his life he was uh, a love poet a secular poet in a sense and le then later on he dedicated most of his poetry to, to religion to God to the church to, to his faith and belief. Do you notice anything about this? It's not in your book, it's, here. It's, it's only here. It's short, yeah. And by the way, some people insist that uh, this is a feature of metaphysical poetry, shortness. People wanted to say, you know, a lot in poetry. But they, these people are very laconic, they're concise and precise. It doesn't mean they didn't write long uh, long poems. John Donne himself, in one of the, what I consider to be, it's a very serious poem on the death of somebody, but I consider it funny as well, because he was writing a poem for one of his patrons whose son passed away, and clearly John Donne was expected to write a poem for the death of the man who kind of takes care of him financially and socially and politically perhaps. So instead of him writing him a short poem, a sonnet could have been enough. But he wrote him two long poems, almost 2,000 lines, just for the death of a little kid whom Dan probably has never met or seen or known. And there is a lot to, to unravel here. In, in my understanding, this is a way uh, John Dan, in which John Dan is protesting how uh, patrons impose on poets what to write and what not to write. It's, one, it's a beautiful poem, it's very long, not easy to read, but when you read it and you find, you know, uh, all these, you know, metafictional elements, all these references to how uh, uh, poets are used, 
I think John Donne writing these two long poems is also an expression of protest. And we're not like machines, you just turn us on or off. Because again, simply speaking, he could have just written a sonnet. If he wrote a sonnet for that kid, the father would be over the moon. So this uh, religious man, George Herbert, in Arif, if, can you look closely? So somebody said it's a short poem. Yeah. It's a short poem. Uh, how, many, how many lines? Um, Twelve. Twelve. So a sonnet? No. Definitely not a sonnet. No falls short of a sonnet. It falls short. He could have, it's, I don't think it would have been difficult for somebody, a poet like this, to write a sonnet, but there is, in my understanding, again, there is a deliberate, you know, change here. He doesn't want to write a sonnet. I don't want to write a sonnet. This is where everything I have to say ends. Because if you look at the rhyme scheme, perhaps the rhyme scheme alternates a, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, you know? Yes. Similar to Shakespeare in a way. And then we go back to B here because it's the same stanza almost. Yeah? B, A, B, A. So A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, and then B, A, B A. What else? <coughs> you don't have time to uh, do a lot to this poem, but can you look closely? No, no. So, a couplet like there could have been a G G here, or not A B C D E E, and then we have almost a Shakespearean sonnet. But so not a sonnet. What 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 can you see? That uh, last uh, word in the each line is repeated in the second, in the next one. Uh, what do you mean? Praise and it's... OK, so there is praise here. And then there's praise here. And then... Then give. And give. What else? There is also here ways here and ways here, right? Live and live, straight and straight, three, this is the and the, deceit and deceit, simplicity, simplicity, and also live again, and live, ways, there's give here, and give here, but also there is praise in the opening line, and there's also praise here. Don't tell me this is not a deliberate thing. Oh, this, of course, this could be uh, not a repetition. Could be something uh, like some. Some might say there is here a lot of artificiality. This is artificial. You know, you're sitting on the table, you're writing this, you're changing, and you're writing, you're changing. Some might say this is a lot more than neoclassical poetry who strictly follow the rules. Again, making sure that everything uh, counts perfectly the same, or rhymes the same, or has the same number of syllables, etc. Possible, if you want to say that this is artificial, possible, but because in my opinion, writing itself is, a, is an artificial process because you, sometimes it flows, but sometimes you force yourself, you think, you squeeze your mind. But what is new here is the fact that the meaning is very much connected is with the form. The form is not arbitrary. The form is not a template given for poets here, for the metaphysicals to fill in with words and language and ideas and imagery and metaphors. It's part and parcel of, of the meaning. In a sense, this forms something. What does it form? The image. What, what image does the poem in this in repeating words, connecting every line with the other, what, what image does it create? Can you imagine? 
Yeah. Yeah, can you imagine? Very good. Create this. The, the, the opening and the beginning here, the opening line and the ending line are connected. But it's not only that. Actually, it's everything is connected. Because it takes, you know, it's like when you connect, when you thread something, if you, you know, when you thread something and you create it and then at the end you just knot the two ends and then you have this perfect wreath. Now sometimes this is called concrete poetry. Poetry where the shape is part and parcel of the meaning. In, in metaphysical poetry, the shape is always part of the meaning. And sometimes it's extreme to the extent that we can see it exactly like, sorry, like this poem. The poem we're going to study in detail today. It's called Easter Wings by George Herbert. And the term Easter is a religious term. Easter Wings. If you notice, again, Okay. <coughs> like sand clock, yeah? yeah. This time is running, but then. They look like wings. But also, if you take them this way. But again, we agree that there's something in the shape. Yes. Yes. Whether you take it as wings or something else. Two angels, two birds flying, these being the wings. So wing, 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 four wings, two birds, two angels. Especially if you take it this way. Now this way, the poem sounds more like a bird than anything else. Look at this. Of course, it's not a perfect bird. But, more or less. Now, in the 20th century, this has become very famous, concrete poetry. Like, tweaking the, the shape of the poem to accommodate what it says. Just looking at the poem gives you an impression. So this is not only even like a shape of a bird, but there's also this thing where we have something Short, like beginning, huge, long, healthy, wealthy, having stuff, and then losing, probably. Decreasing. This decline gets to the thinnest point here. And then again, something happens, and then we go up to increase it again. And the same, the process goes on and on. Okay, so th this is how it looks in the book, the poem. And this is one of the early manuscripts. Looks a bit like a bird. So what's going on here? This is stanza number one, two stanzas, short stanzas. Can someone read, please? Yeah. Though, you know, if you say most poor with thee, I, th I think this is going to change the meaning a little bit. Mm -hmm. Till he became yeah. most poor. Full stop. Start Take a breath. With. Take a bite. Mm -hmm. Chew. Digest. And then with thee. Harmoniously. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Very good reading. One more. Lord, okay, Speak up. Up, up, up. Lord, okay, 
foolishly. Foolishly, he lost the same. This uh, became more and more. Till him became more and more. Uh, with the all of me learned uh, as like uh, hum, harmoniously. Har harmoniously. 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 And sing this day the victory. Thy. Thy victory. Then shall the uh, the fall further reply to me. One more, please. Most poor. Most poor. With thee, O let me rise, as larks harmoniously, and sing this day thy victory, then shall the fall for the life. Thank you. Beautiful. Let's read the second stanza before we do commentary. Noor? My tender agent sorrow did it begin, <clears throat> and still with sickness, sicknesses and shame, thou didst so punish sin. That I became most thin with thee. Let me combine and feel the victory. Thy victory. Thy victory. For, uh, for if I am my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. Very good. Affliction shall advance the flight in me. Yep. My tender age in it began, and is still with sickness and shame. Thou didst so punish. Uh, and shame. And shame. Thou didst so punish sin that I became most thine with thee. Most me, thin. Most thin with thee. Let me combine and feel very by victory. For it I am, my wings on the thine. Affli uh, affliction shall advance. The For if I imp my wing on thine, affliction. Affliction, affliction shall advance the flight in mine. One more, finally, please. My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with sicknesses and shame, though did is so punish sign. Sin. Sin. That I began most time. Sin. With thee, let me combine and feel thy victory. For if I imp my wing on time, affliction shall advance the flight of me. Okay, thank you very much. Good reading. Lord, who created man in wealth and store. Though foolishly he lost the, the same, decaying more and more till he became most poor. With thee, O oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day thy victories. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. Before we see what's going on, is there anything to say about the form? Yeah. And I think the length of the lines are related to the meanings. So, so the, the lengths are related to the meaning. To the meaning. Are you sure? Yes. Uh, the first line is it's telling us the man. The first line, which is the longest line. The longest line tells us that the man in wealth and store. Okay, very good. So, God created man, created us, in wealth and store. He almost gave us everything we need we require. So this is a line with God giving us and we having all wealth and store. Wealth probably things we already have and then things in store for us to be given at one time in the future. So this is the longest line. And then second line, what happens in the second line? Yeah? No, we, not, we haven't gotten to sins yet. There is losing. Giving by God, losing by man. And this loss is described by the poet as foolish. We foolishly leave God behind, abandon God. And that means we lose the wealth and we lose the things hidden to us in store. And... We don't only do this, it just keeps getting worse. It's not just one sin. If you sin once, you keep sinning. You keep going down this alley and you lose more and more. So the line, next, line three, decaying more and more. We keep deteriorating, going farther away from God. Till he became most poor. That's 
the shortest line. One syllable, two syllables. So, so this part is again explaining this process of how God created us and gave us everything. Everything we need. I think there is some kind of system here. If you count the syllables, which we should always do, there is also a systematic, you know, narrowing down, like a funnel. How many syllables can you see in nine. line number nine. one? Nine. Nine. nine syllables, can you count? Okay, read the syllable and say one. This syllable and say two. Any, any objection? What's that? So you're giving this how many syllables? How? How so? Thank you very much. Create, create, create. That's a deaf tongue kind of thing. Or I, I, I saw some people counting this. I don't like to count the ist at the end of this, but create, create. How many syllables in create? Two syllables. Create and then create it. So we have. Ten syllables, yeah. meaning five, five feet. 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 And then number two, yes. eight, syllables. eight syllables. There's one, two, two three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four, four feet. And then, please. D, K, Yang, Ma, and Ma. One, two, three, four, five, six syllables. Three feet, and then that's four syllables. Thank you very much. Two feet, and then finally, most poor two syllables meaning one, one fourth. It's always tricky going from feet to foot. Hmm, interesting, very systematic. And then something happens. Despite this, despite the fact that we leave God behind, we abandon God, there is usually a chance for us to go back. Of course, we suffer here. We pay. We become more poor. We lose everything. Probably physically, but also spiritually. We lose our faith. And that's the poorest we could be. Of course, the book could have said the poorest, but that's going to break the the, you know, the thing, the RAM scheme possible, but also the, uh, the number of feet. Now something happens here. With thee, oh, let me arise. With thee, Lord. With thee, again, we have rising here. Again, this is, this is a religious issue. Like, you sin, you lose, you repent, you go back, atone for your mistakes, for sins. God accepts you. And this is also very common in, in, jo in, in George Herbert. Let me rise as larks. There is a simile here. As larks, as birds. And again, creating the wings. Harmoniously. Not only that, but also sing. Sing, probably preaching, talking to people, repenting. This day, thy victories. God is always victorious. Man never wins. We always lose and decay and foolishly become poor. And lose this day thy victory, and sorry, sing this day thy victory. Thy meaning your victories. Then the flight, the, then shall the fall, the fall shall, then shall the fall further the flight in me. If you count, it's also two syllables, four syllables, six syllables, eight syllables, and then ten syllables. We go back to being cool. But there is, so I don't know, like, is he saying it's good to fall? 
because it's going to further the flight in us. It's going to bring us closer to God. Or if he says, if, or is he saying, like, if you fall, don't worry, there's always uh, going back to God. And perhaps when you fall, you, go, you get closer to God because you learn your lesson. Because you, you, you lost them and then you get them yes, back. So this you learn your lesson. A boost in your faith and okay, but it's going to happen again in the second stanza. It's going to happen again. So what about the rhyme scheme, ladies? No, somebody, please. Okay, A, B, A, B, A. A, B, A, B, A. I like th how this, this is called alternating rhyme. Probably giving us the impression of the movement of the wing. Okay. Then with the C, D. Are you sure? C and harmoniously. Pos possibly imperfect rhyme. If you want to just stress it a little bit. But again, 50%. This is V, and this is harmoniously. Imperfect rhyme. And then victories, also, like cries, D, imperfect rhyme. And then me, C. So A, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, D, C. Sounds perfect, but there is something here. Two imperfections, wow. Interesting. Now, I want to notice two things because before going back to the rhyme scheme. The simile, and the simile is a lot easier than, uh, a, metaphor. than a metaphor because you see the word as or like. Yes. So, I will be like a bird. As larks. As larks. And I love this, the, the sound at the end. It's called alliteration. Look at this. The fall further the flight. Fall further flight. It sounds like this is the only alliteration in English language. Shame. You know, we had it in Shakespeare. We had it in, uh, in Robinson. Uh, what's his name? The guy uh, who solicits to hunt. Every fair from fair. I think we'll have it more. But again, yes, it's true that the, the uh, alliteration, alliteration is the repetition of the, the same uh, sound, the same consonant sounds at the beginning of words, basically. It creates music. Emphasizes what? Just emphasizes? That's not a poetic answer. There, thank you very much. There's this, shall the fall further the flight, you know? The, the, the fluttering, thank you very much. You know, fluttering, when, when, when birds move, they create this, this sound. It helps us visualize and imagine. It gives us this, the, this, the fall, shall the fall further the flight in me? Now, my question is, when there is an imperfect rhyme, there usually is a reason. There could be something hidden behind the message of the poem. The most ironic thing in the poem is the fact that the word harmoniously is imperfect, is imperfect. But harmony means perfection, perfect, concord, order, balance. Things go back to how they were. And even the word victories, they're victories, but they are imperfect victories. So what's going on, perhaps? I think it's because uh, he's telling us that in the next stanza, that something, everything will go back to its, its basis. It will fall again, and the victories will fall again. That's good. Right. This could be connected with the fact that man will always relapse, always fall, always drop. What else? Please. The book of John, the big book that this, uh, returns to God is not imperfect. Not imperfect or not perfect? Uh, not perfect. Okay. 
not Very good. Maybe to indicate that the pure faith that he was given by God is now smudged by this... Uh, Worldly pleasures and getting... Nice, thank you. I think like it is a message for man, for man of, uh, or for humans that whatever victory you have reached in this life is not that the big victory. There's a in the era. Oh, yeah, I like this. So, worldly victories and harmonies are not perfect. Perfection, you know, it's like play to the world, this world and the world of being, the perfect world. No. The world in, in heaven. That's a, that's a good idea. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, he's talking about his. No, thy. thy. He's, talking, he's talking to possibly because he's here. Oh, let me arise, Lord who created, let me arise and then and sing thy, this day thy victories. But doesn't necessarily mean God's victories. Could be. Could indicate that God's victories are not uh, complete. But because these victories are sung by this man, they're not perfect. Or man doesn't, you know, follow them perfectly. I don't know. This is a religious poem. Look at this man. But look at the concept, the, the Christian concept here of suffering, falling, and this creates a very significant paradox. Remember paradoxes? Paradox, self-contradictory statement. That sounds illogical. What, how? How can you rise when you fall? It doesn't make sense. But we hear this all the time, like there's nothing wrong with falling. S remaining on the ground is, is, is the, the wrong. You should always rise. Now if we go to the second uh, uh, stanza quickly, the same pattern is repeated. Very same pattern is repeated. If we want to uh, uh, see the rhyme scheme for the sake of time, Look at, this is old spelling, usually double the last uh, letter, usually an extra E. I don't know, they had many E's at that time, so they would be throwing them here and there. But you never say sign here because oh, this is when you say sign. When, the, when you have one sin. consonant letter, this is sin. Begin. So begin, a rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, B, A, B, B, A, B, 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 and then A, A, and then C, C D, D, victory, C, C, C also, you know, victory, and then, and then we have thine, combine, D, and me, C, only just this. But again, usually the victory, victory, victory is short uh, vowel, me is a long vowel. And sometimes me is not a long vowel, by the way. And you could just give it a little bit of a push, a puff of air, victory. So this could go as a more, at least compared to the first stanza, this is uh, more perfect. And he's saying again, my tender age in sorrow did begin. There's a lot of sorrow in our lives, especially when we don't know God. And still with sickness and shame thou didst so punish sin, that I became most thin. I suffered the most, most poor, most thin. With thee, however, when you punish me, God, I know that you're doing this for, for my own good. You punish me, so I, I change, so I go back to you. The suffering I, 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 I experience is not a suffering because you hate me or because you just enjoy torturing me. It's because you love me because it takes me back to you. With thee again, let me combine and feel thy victory. For if I imp, imp, link, connect my wing on thine affliction, suffering, pain, shall advance the flight in me. Affliction, suffering, when we suffer, many people say when we suffer, we, we shed out worldly things, worldly pleasures. Makes us light, makes us rise up, makes us more spiritual and materialistic. So affliction, for many people, again, this is if somebody is suffering, if somebody is in pain, you're usually down. But because this is a religious concept, 
this affliction, the more you suffer, that's the message here, yeah, the more you suffer, the higher you rise. Affliction shall advance the flight in me. Again, another paradox ending, ending the poem. You understand it in the religious, religious sense. You lose your worldly uh, things, concerns, pains, and you go up to God. This is called concrete poetry. Um, George Herbert was the master of this. He did this like uh, many times. And in the 20th century, this became fa fashion. Even now, many people like to do this. Imagine, I don't know, would you hate this poem if you were an Elizabethan uh, lady? Would you hate this? Like, not this particular, but this kind of poetry, metaphysical poetry. I think that, like, this is the first thing that came to my mind when we first read it. This, this is probably one of the best and most beautiful religious piece of work, I would say, mm. that I've ever read. Because, like, it's whole, like, I feel that the poet put his whole heart into it, and he, he combined everything. That's George like, Herbert. Every, yes, every single piece of, of like every okay. letter has a significance, and even like the way he uh, associated the word wing with the, uh, at the end of the poem, I don't know, like everything makes sense. And, and then, then we have two birds flying next to each other. That's him and God, because he says, I want to combine my wing with your wing so we can exactly. fly next what to each I other. What I love the most is that like when you said as an Elizabethan lady, I thought of it as, okay, as a, I'm a, as a human being, I do not feel that I am offended or I am, mm. or I am being like discriminated against any possible way here. I feel like I am as equal as anyone else. In, in you should know that, especially with John Donne, most of his, you know, narrow, small, inner circle, uh, the members were mostly women. Oh. But again, it doesn't mean, like many people use this to prove that he was not anti-feminist. But no, I care more about what he says in the poem rather than what happened. Okay, let's uh, wrap this up with these. I squeezed my mind and listed these 17, 17 uh, features of metaphysical poets, mainly John Donne. Some of them are overlap necessarily. Some of them overlap. Uh, on the Facebook group, I posted the list and said, if you want to choose one to talk about, you're welcome. And I thank you, I have some volunteers. So who wants to speak about wit and intellectuality? Okay, no one? Uh, so basically there is a lot of wit, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, you, you need to put a lot of effort in order to understand John Donne and his poetry. It doesn't make it difficult, it doesn't make it impossible. It just invites you to read it again and again and again. And you will be surprised. Remember the, what, what, what's the poem? The bait. You'll be surprised how, for example, we take it as a love poem. How many, many critics believe that this is also a pure religious poem. So the layers and the layers, this is a Shakespearean thing. You keep going back to the text and you keep, the text keep, keeps finding. And this is one reason, by the way, John Donne came back to life 300 years ago. I don't like to say that T.S. Eliot resurrected him. John Donne was always there. We found him, he found, he found us. So there is logic, there is intellectuality in, in, in the poetry. The poem uh, usually so sounds like uh, some kind of linguistic, not linguistics, linguistic weightlifting experience because you need to exert effort not only in the idea and following the idea, but also uh, uh, the grammar and the syntax. Uh, and therefore, we usually un unravel many possibilities and many interpretations for the same poem. Uh, the other day, we, I was asking, why is John Donne employing religious discourse in, in, a, in, a, in a sexual, secular uh, poem like uh, uh, the, the, the Flea? What, what is the religious discourse doing there? And the students gave me four possible answers, and all of them are valid. Some are saying he was intimidating her. Some are saying he was abusing his religious power. Some are saying he was criticizing and attacking religious people who abuse, who abuse religion. And some might say that, no, he wants to sound good because clearly she says this is sin, so oh, she's a religious woman and he, you know, like a chameleon, he changes to just 
look good to her, or many other ideas, all possible in my opinion. And at the end of the poem, usually you end up with more questions than answers, and this is, this is the best kind of literature, at least to me. I know many people read, watch movies, read stuff, just seeking answers. Sometimes it's not about the answers, it's about the questions posed there. Therefore, one of the late metaphysicals, Thomas uh, Caro, said, wrote a very beautiful uh, el elegy poem uh, for John Donne, and he ends it with, th with this. Here lies a king that ruled as he thought fit the universal monarchy of wit. He ruled the universal mon monarchy of wit. I like to take wit as, in Arabic, daha, like extreme intelligence, not only in argument, but also in using language and everything. Answer this, Alexander Pope, who said, huh, John Donne doesn't even have imagination. Crazy, critics can be. Uh, realism, as opposed to uh, Elizabethan idealism, somebody wanted to speak about this already? Come here, please. Can you explain this briefly in two minutes? Ihsan, yeah? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, some critics say that thoughts in Don's poetry were not uh, his primary concern, but his feeling. So there's for him no interpretation for life, and the inter interpretation for life became for him a complete and eliminating experience. So the theme was not love, the theme was uh, his personal intense moods. As uh, any other a new classical poet, uh, we're idealizing love and courtly admiration and looking for perfection, eternity. Don was bringing everything down with his poem. Not only he changed the feet, subject matter, and the poetic words, but also he changed the whole image of idealism at that age, which was you know, the, the society was not ideal, so he's, he's bringing the society into his poems. In the Death Be Not Proud, he started with a dramatic opening, Death, which is completely different from uh, the sweet words like in Shakespeare's sonnets. He instead used the cruel words like, mighty, dreadful, die, and poor. In the flea, he said, though parents grudge and you weren't met, the image of having the complete approval of the parents and, and the beloved herself is now changed by Don and he's, he didn't have the approval of her parents, neither her approval. She, she's not uh, thrilled with him. She even wants to kill them, him. So he's like uh, saying, it's too late for that. We are already married. So I wrote also a parody. Uh, I'll give you time for parody because we are running out of about Excellent answer. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan, and thank you for writing a parody. Okay, give her a hand. Thank you. Uh, so, idealism, courtly love, was the main thing, the main trend, you know? Uh, and now, John Donne, and this is something I, I usually claim, brought poetry to the realities of life and love rather than to the idealism and utopia in the mind of, of the poet. The lover is usually an ordinary man. Not special, albeit very witty, remember. And the woman is not the fairest of all, yet very special to him, to the poet. Don's poetry is deeply rooted in reality. And we'll see, thank you, Hassan, for connecting this. This is all connected, and how this is connected with the dramatic openings, uh, they overlap. And uh, finally, he brought, this is my claim also, he brought poetry from the ivory towers of the palaces, of the court, of the king, to the streets, to the, ma to the masses, to us. Parody and meta poetry and satire. Who wants to talk about parody? Okay, Islam. Two minutes. Um, hello, class. Uh, so parody in its simplest form is an invitation for a certain purpose. So in poetry, it's an invitation of another, okay, it's an invitation of another poet's original work, style, or subject. So why do poets use uh, a parody? Uh, first, uh, poets want to comment on other poets or other poems by not just saying their, their opinion explicitly, but in a kind of creative technique that is more interesting and keeps the reader more attractive. Two, um, it is sometimes used to criticize a certain a theme in the society in general or in poetry. 
Uh, the third reason is that it's sometimes for pure humor. It's sometimes just to provoke fun and entertain your reader. Uh, another thing is that beginning writers back then used the parody or to, used to imitate a certain type of writing for a certain famous author, uh, both to get attention or to get used of writing this time. So we had many examples so far on the parody. Uh, I'll mention two of them. In Shakespeare's Sonnet uh, 113, my mistress' eyes are nothing, are not, are not, nothing like the sun. Um, uh, it's a parody to all poetry uh, of his, uh, his time. What about Dunn? Okay, we'll come to him. Quickly. Okay. Um, uh, he's, using, he's presenting an anti-love poem in the most sacred uh, form of poetry, and uh, it is the sonnet. So he is um, criticizing the exaggeration comparison made by, by poets in describing the beloved and her beauty. So um, uh, the second example is uh, Dunn, um, uh, the bait, and also uh, her reply by Sir Walter Relay. Uh, they are both parodies of, um, of uh, Marlowe's uh, Come Live With Me. Uh, in her reply, we see that the women interact and react. And uh, in the bait, Come Live With Me, we see a more realistic version of the poem where, he, where we can believe him. And we can see the woman interact and be more, uh, her, her existence is the poem is more than Marlowe's poem. Thank you very much. Give her a hand too, thank you. Uh, I know we'll, you'll read like almost everywhere, people saying, focusing on the comic aspect, the hilarity of the of parody itself, taking it as, even the dictionaries, even the literary box define it as a comic imitation of something. And I think this is missing a lot and lacking. For John Donne, parody was a serious genre. Because what he's doing, yes, he's imitating, yes, we kind of like, you know, laugh, like, what? But then later on, he invites us to reconsider not only the poem, but the whole world view, because he's taking the, the Elizabethan world view and social constructs of how women are and how women are presented, and he's turning this upside down and inside out. So parody is serious here. Now, meta poetry is usually John Donne referring to his poetry himself in poetry. I don't have much time to talk about this. If you're interested, I can send you more uh, material. And again, he uses... Uh, satire, some people think John Donne is the king of satire. So there's usually the underlying message uh, where he targets previous and contemporary poets. We, sometimes it's uh, implicit, sometimes it's explicit. Uh, in the bait, it's, uh, that could be implicit, like in the bait, or explicit like in the sonnet. I think it should be the opposite. Explicit like in the bait, because the bait clearly says, uh, Come live with me, and but inviting us for like some new pleasures. And the, the sonnet, some people ask, I don't see parody in the sonnet. Yes, there is. When everybody is writing a love sonnet, the man is changing the sonnet itself radically. Meta poetry is poetry about poetry, it's like meta fiction, where there are references. Because John Donne did not write a book of criticism or articles of criticism talking about his poetry. In my understanding, he embedded these ideas in his in his poetry. He attacks, satirizes the rules of versification as well as the social and religious constructs of, of the time. Mixture of secular and religious. Anybody? This is up for grab. Okay, now uh, uh, the rules of decorum determine that you don't mix comedy and tragedy. Tragedy is a tragedy, a comedy is a comedy, and they shall not meet, they shouldn't meet. Even comic relief was not something that people liked. Shakespeare exp uh, experimented on this. He, kinda, he, he, he did this. He included tragic things in comedies, but most importantly, he included comic scenes in, in tragedies. Now, with John Donne, he basically is doing the same. He's mixing sometimes a pure love poem, like the bait. He, use, he uses religion for a particular purpose. And sometimes it's the opposite. If you read, I assume, what is it, Sonnet? 12, I can't, the holy sonnet uh, that begins with batter my heart, my three-person God. See the, the references to uh, sensuality or something like this. So he makes his genres and makes references to God and religion in his poetry and vice, and vice versa. Is this because of the influence, his, his, his religious background, his, his faith influencing his, his poetry? Or is he doing something else? Is John Donne mocking those who abuse uh, religion? If you have time, you can look into that. Dramatic openings and 
open endings. Actually, this came to me the other class. One of the students suggested that there could be open ended endings in uh, more open endings than closed endings in journal. I'm like, well, let me look into this. And I really, if these are short stories, what happens next is the question we ask at the end. Like in the flea, what, what does the what does the woman do? I don't want to talk more much. Let's give two minutes to uh, Noha. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Okay, first of all, I just want to say that I've read many uh, many articles that John is uh, John Dunn is one of those poets who, if you don't like if, if like you don't like him in the first sight at the first sight if you don't like him, you will end up either either loving him so much the way that I am right now or you hate him so much so uh, there's no in between step. So I want to talk about the dramatic openings and uh, the open endings. First of all, when you read some of uh, the metaph metaphysical poems, you will find out that uh, most of them start with uh, abrupt and sudden beginnings, such as like death, be not proud, or like this indicates if we go back in time a little bit and we look into the history of the 16th and 17th century, uh, we will find out that there were there were lots of like violence and confrontation between this the like the Catholic England and the um, Protestant Europe or something. So uh, John Donne, being this religious person of the Catholic uh, of a Catholic religion, uh, he was like absolutely uh, inspired, let's say, by this theme of the of the age he was living in. So this was kind of reflected on uh, his poem. His poems. Okay. Uh, also, you can see you can see the beginnings being colloquial and conversational, such as the parody that you wrote about, like "Come live with me and be my love." And uh, so you can see that this is kind of conversational. Uh, we can see this kind of dark tone. Uh, it's like when he when he's talking to Death, he's like pulling Death by the by the uh, collar and telling him like, "Okay, you shall die" and stuff. So uh, it's very dark, uh, direct tone. Also, uh, most of his beginnings are aggressive towards the addressee and sometimes towards us as listeners or as readers. Like when he says, uh, like, mark this flea or come live with me. I know that some people w would like read it as, okay, mark this flea or something. But for me, using this imperative tone is like using 500 uh, exclamation marks. So this is very uh, confusing. Uh, also, uh, lots of his poetry start with apostrophe, which is like a figure of speech in which the uh, poet addresses an absent person or an abstract idea or a thing. So, uh, addressing the lover or addressing uh, death or anything. Also, the theme is very obvious from the very first beginning of his poetry. Uh, we can see uh, John Donne being or constructing, con like deconstructing the themes of. Uh, the previous poets, and he is making this very clear from the very first beginning. Uh, okay, now I want to talk about the open endings, but before that, I want to make a very uh, small uh, connection between the beginnings and endings and uh, Don's poetry. Now, there, this is something very interesting. He uses logic and reason, reason in un, in and unexpected places. For example, when he uh, when he's talking about death, he starts with death be not proud, and he ends with death thou shalt die. So during the whole poem, you can understand that he is giving you reasons. He's deconstructing what you already have in your mind, and he's saying like uh, all other people shall live again, and you shall die at the end. So uh, during the whole poem, he's just giving you reasons so that when you read the end, the ending, you will yes come to a conclusion that he is true, okay. that this is true. Now, uh, also in the flea, he starts like, um, he wants to take, he can't, he doesn't take no for an answer. Like he starts with, yes, I want you to be my lover. And if you said this, I will be like, if the flea died, yes, okay, well, she died, nothing happened. So we will be together. If she did not die, so yes, we can be together. So this is very interesting. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Exactly. So. <laughs> And also, of course, Love's Diet, we can see how he connected the beginning with an ending when he, uh, <coughs> like, the beginning was very hard and the ending was uh, something. Okay, okay finally. Uh, about the open ending, I just want to say that most of uh, most of Don's poems end with a very open ending. Like, you do not really, you have more questions, as Dr. Rifat said, you, right. had more, you have more questions than, uh, than answers from the ending. Thank you very much. Give her a hand. I don't have much to say. Uh, I, I thank you for connecting this to Catholicism and the uh, problem, you know, started with King Henry VIII. 
But I like to, to connect the dramatic openings to the fact that th he was living in the golden age of, of drama, theater. So this could be. I claim that all his, almost all his poems look like small scenes or sketches or mini plays, miniature plays. And usually you feel, I have the feeling that they begin me in medias res. They be begin in the middle. Like when you come, Mark, but this flea, there is always something before that makes you think. And yes, the endings uh, leave us with more questions than, than answers. Empowering women. Empowering women, Nadia. Two minutes. Empowering women, meaning feminism in Jordan. Hello everyone, so uh, we're talking about empowering women. The question consists, uh, consists of two parts. The first one is the importance of this feature. Well, I think we all unanimously agree the, uh, the importance of empowering women, but I think the question focuses, why should we empower them in literature? Uh, at the beginning of this course, we talked about how uh, 100 years prior to the Zionist occupation, uh, like, uh, a lot of, lit of their literature was urging and like, uh, talking about Palestine and like, convincing them that you should go there, this is the land of milk and honey, and then a hundred years later, this came true. A lot of factors played a role in that, but literature was one of them. I think it, across all uh, ages, women that were discriminated against and stereotyped, and like there, there's always a woman, an image created, created of them. So it is important that we talk, about, we talk about those stereotypes in literature over and over again, so that we criticize them. And we know that literature is a, like a, mir a mirror of society, but it's also a way of criticizing, criticizing it and mentioning its faults. Um, like, and this was written in the Elizabethan, in, in Elizabethan England, where even the, the, the people like the queen who were the, in the highest position had this inferiority complex. Like in one of her speeches in, in front of her people before a battle, she said, I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, which is like clearly inferior. Uh, well, Don tried to to point out those uh, those things, and he tried to make a woman powerful, not not like different. She's not always good. Sometimes she's evil, but she's different. She's not stereotyped. We saw in the debate that she's present and she's active, uh, and like he's. In the, at the very beginning, he's being realistic with, with his promises to her because he knows that she's, she will not be easily deceived or fooled with his unachievable promises when he says some new pleasures. And at, at, the, uh, at the end of the poem, he, sees, uh, he says that though need is no such deceit, she is cunning and deceiving men who, who, who try to get her, or, but like she's a bait, she's going to eventually get them out of water and kill them. And this is not like advocating for murder, but it's just saying that women are capable of doing this. Um, well, and in the flea, the, the woman is also present and active. She doesn't, ju she doesn't speak yes, but she strikes back. She's rejecting him when she says, uh, when, when he says like, uh, the parents grudges and you uh, were met. And then he says that she's cruel and sudden with him. She's act she actually directly wants to kill him she's, when he says, Though we we make you up to kill me, and finally she kills the flea that he that was so sacred to him and was like a representation of their relationship and their marriage or whatever. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, not much to say, but still some people insist that John Donne is not only a, an anti-feminist but also a misogynist, somebody who hates uh, women. It's up to you to see uh, 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 whether he is feminist or anti-feminist, whether you agree with Dryden or with, uh, what's her name, Virginia Woolf. Uh, meaning of our rules. Uh, so I, I refer to this many times, that the, the metaphysicals would bend and twist the rules to serve their purpose. Because Dunn seems to believe that following uh, uh, the, the repressive, I would say, uh, rules would restrict and limit his experience, his thoughts, his feelings, and uh, the way he, he should be writing uh, poetry. Again, I'm saying here in practice because he didn't write another. He said, hey, you shouldn't follow the rules. We, we can deduce this reading his poetry. Dan thought that rules were limiting and restraining. Even the sonnet was turned upside down and inside out by John uh, Dunn. The form and the content are closely connected. Two minutes to Noor. Um, so we want to... Uh, 
we want to talk about the form and the content, we know that form is how the subject is expressed and the content is the subject itself. Mm -hmm. So they are both work as a team, so we cannot separate them. The content provides something to express for the audience and the form supplies us the methods and techniques which are necessary to beautify the board. We cannot consider the form is, uh, as a fixed container, so it's like a bottle to fill it just with words. Um, uh, unless we have to, uh, to have a content or a subject matter, so uh, they are uh, work as a team and work uh, very well. Moreover, form and, uh, undergo, <coughs> undergoes a change according to the uh, writer's formal choice. So if he choose um, a sonnet or a haiku or a free verse form, it uh, will change uh, from uh, according to, the, to these types. For instance, uh, when, a, uh, when a poet wants to pour his content in a sonnet form, he has to comply uh, with certain rules. It means the form regulate contents, and we have already studied this in Shakespeare sonnets, particularly sonnet 18 and 130. So Shakespeare, when he, want, uh, when he started to write uh, sonnets, he started to write sonnets with uh, 14 lines, with um, a love subject matter and a specific rhyme scheme. In contrast, John Donne, it changed the rhyme scheme and the syllable, uh, the syllable are uh, longer because of his belief that the meaning is more important than the uh, secret form of the sonnet. But it is still 14 lines. Uh, form and content should have an uh, architectural uh, relationship and build the poem using uh, them together. A form organizes and enhances and serves the content to, produ uh, to produce a masterpiece of poems. Through our study, we talk Shakespearean sonnet, and the iambic meter of the poem is unstressed, then stressed. He said, uh, shall I compare thee to summer's day? So he starts with unstressed one because of the content subject, which is love, in order to be soft and uh, gentle with his beloved. In contrast, John Donne changed the subject matter to religious one, so his son to start with a stressed, <coughs> then unstressed one. He said, death be not proud, though some have called thee. Another point is the, the, is the Shakespearean rhyming couplet at the end of the sonnet, which includes the perfect language using a, a clue a, through the sonnet. Uh, another example, uh, at Marlowe's poem, The Patient Shiver, Marlowe uses a regular rhyme and meter and uh, be used in the iambic meter, which means he got the four iambic line, mm -hmm. and he also get a pretty basic done. rhymes. Scheme. What does Dan do? Uh, Jump, yeah. About what? Dan, about this. Does he do the same? No. What does he do so, in one sentence? He didn't uh, have a, um, the same iambic meter, he changed it. He changes. Uh, Thank you very much. So John Donne adapts the form to yeah. serve. To serve the meaning. Rules yeah. should not be limiting. Thank you very much, Noor. Give her a hand. Uh, again, we're running short of time, so I want you to, to rush those who come here. Uh, we said something about this. Anybody talk anti-mainstream, anti-establishment? Less than two minutes, quickly. You don't have to read everything you wrote, just give us the gist. <coughs> okay, let's see Roseanne. Okay, anti-establishment uh, or anti-establishmentarianism. It means like to go against, isn't it? Okay, go on. It is the longest word in English. So it means to go against the mainstream, uh, to go against the mainstream um, of, of, of the time. Uh, maybe it will be like a pol political word or uh, economic or for literature. So John Donne. So John Donne and the Metaphysical's visit for literature. So uh, John Donne was against the mainstream at that time. He used different, uh, like the, the Elizabethan strict rules for uh, the high sophisticated language and the subject matter <coughs> and other uh, rules. He like, um, he didn't uh, come, uh, 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 Example? Not, yeah, not with all these rules. So for example, he didn't use uh, 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 the diction, the high sophisticated language, for example, he said, let others freeze with angry reeds and cut their legs with shell and reeds. So it is not poetic words uh, uh, that the Elizabethan poet, poets wrote like this at that time, not like uh, uh, Shakespeare, shall I compare to you to a summer's day. Uh, so again, he, he was like, um, 
unconventional topics like debate and the flea. So they are like uh, against the mainstream at the time also. Excellent. Talking about the form, uh, the form, uh, he used like the form of the Senate. Thank you. We already form. spoke about the form. Give her a hand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next, Mai. We're running out of time. Okay, you can have a look at this. We only have like five minutes. Dialogism, nobody took dialogism. One minute. Yeah? Be faster than Roseanne. Get to the point, don't read. Yeah. It's important as it shows the addressee's personality, emotions, and the actions, and gives a voice for him or her to connect with the void of the voids or the persona's expressions and feelings. Nice. An example of the direction in metaphysical poetry is shown thus the flea while he was trying to convince her to wait, be his wait. love. Wait, Calm down, yeah. While he was trying to convince her to be with him and uh, be, his, uh, be his love, uh, she refuses, not by words, but by actions. She makes, uh, the actions she makes sounds like refusal, so we can admit that she exists and she has a voice Thank of you. rejection to his love. Thank you very Unlike much. Marlo. Unlike Marlo. Unlike Marlo. We know Marlo already what he did. <laughs> Thank you. Wait a minute. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave. Thank you very much. Go, no, you leave. So, give her a hand. Now, we had... A monologic world, a world with one voice dominated by the man at that time. But here we have uh, uh, John Donne inviting other people to, uh, to the poem and uh, engaging in, in dialogue. You can have a look at this. Uh, colloquial language and conversational tone already mentioned by some of you. Thoughts and feelings. Now, according to, uh, to, uh, to T.S. Eliot, uh, the, metaphysicals, the metaphysical poets had this unification of sensibility. There is feelings, emotions, and also thoughts in the same poem. Something, he says that the poets of the 17th century only had thoughts, and then the romantics only had feelings, but it was the metaphysicals who combined both in what he called association of sensibility or unified uh, uh, sen uh, sensibility. There are references to geography and scientific discoveries. Uh, please read, there is, when we talk about drama, I wanted to, to tell you to read The Sun Rising by John Donne, and also read this poem, uh, and I, I, I can't remember the name, but look at how beautiful this uh, poetry is where he's talking to, to his beloved, lie sons my roving hands, as if you know he's discovering an area, geographical area, and let me go before, behind, between, above, below, all oh, my America, my new found land. There is some kind of colonialism there, if you want to trace that, but also look at how he's asking permission, even from his wife, which is very good of a man at that time. Conceits and, and paradoxes, and also puns, a paradox, we just mentioned this, a conceit is a long metaphor between two dissimilar things, and we'll see how John Donne also uh, uh, encourages us to think uh, deep, uh, deeper. Uh, the uh, personal rather than collective, it seems that many poets were writing poetry for, for, for whom? For, for the collective, for the king, for the queen, something to be about battles, about God, about, about you know, the collective of, of the whole society. But for the metaphysicals, it was more of a personal experience and mess, personal encounter rather than uh, writing poetry on the tongue of other people. Uh, usually, like the Romantics, and this is a, something you can trace if you want to find similarities, John Donne's poetry is usually his own feelings and emotions and and experience. His poetry is popular for us, for the masses, rather than for the elite, and this is the idea that he, in a nutshell, brought poetry down, down to earth from the ivory tower. And by doing this, John Donne deconstructs and mocks the rules of, uh, of, of decorum and the fact that poetry is an elite monopoly and elite uh, practice. And finally, argumentative style. We mentioned this in passing with the intellectuality, but I ha usually have the impression that each and every poem is like a logically structured argumentative essay. First stanza being the opening paragraph, then the body paragraphs, supporting sentences, ideas, supporting ideas, and then going for uh, the conclusion. I'm sorry I had to rush some of you for, for this because you have a class uh, now. You can leave. If you have a question, hang around. Thank you very much.